My name's uh, Richard Eastham. I'm an urban planner, an urban designer, and uh, I run a small consultancy practice in Bournemouth. And the Farrier Urbanism Practice uh, has done a lot of work with community groups uh, around the country uh, on both neighbourhood planning and other strategies and design ideas and, and, and planning matters. So uh, we've done work with parish councils and with local authorities and with landowners as well. And uh, a lot of our work in, in recent years has been around neighbourhood planning. And uh, we're currently working with Tysus Parish Council to help them develop their neighbourhood plan. Neighbourhood planning is uh, relatively new. It's, uh, it was introduced under the Coalition Government 2011 through the Localism Act, um, and then it became uh, Law 2012. And there's only about 100 of them have been finished around the country, but there's about 1,000 in preparation. And uh, they're an extremely exciting uh, process because it's the first time that a parish or town councils had the ability to create a legally binding plan. Previous to that, only borough or district councils could do it. So it's now the power to create a, a plan that looks at land use, looks at where new houses could go, where landscape could be protected, uh, issues about transport and movement, uh, cycling, walking. All of that now can be developed at a, a parish level. And uh, the key to it is it's a community-led plan. So they need to engage widely with their community, get the ideas from the people that live and work in these areas, and then create a plan that, uh, that sets out the future. And these plans, when they're finished, will become the, the, the statutory plan for the parish. So it's a very exciting time, really, to be involved in planning. We've been working in, in Hawkers for um, just over a year now, and we've made a really rapid progress with that community. They've been really great. They've, they've really got involved. Uh, the first half of uh, 2015, we did a lot of ideas, work with them and, um, and uh, they, they had a lot of things to put forward. The back end of, of 2015, we tried to write and form policy uh, statements around these ideas. And we're now at this phase now of getting a draft plan pretty much in place uh, to submit for a consultation. And a lot of those ideas have been around traffic and access to the countryside and uh, uh, difficulties in just moving around as a pedestrian there. But they've also had a real sense of um, pride and a real sense of uh, uh, ownership over the wide range of local services they've got there. They've got a digital cinema, a great butchers, some two great pubs, and they want to protect and look after all of that. So a key part of their plan is uh, developing protection around the things that work and improving the, the problem areas. So uh, when the work there is not finished, but it's, it's quite well advanced now. We've um, only really been working in, in the parish since the beginning of the year. Um, we've had a huge number of, of great ideas and uh, uh, however a lot of those ideas we've been told have, have been kicking around for some time you know these uh, these ideas aren't new necessarily so we're hearing them for the first time but we're aware that uh, these, these ideas aren't, aren't necessarily new on the ground so what we really need to do to take things forward is to try and resolve uh, some policy statements to try and write the sort of action plan that is needed around these, these uh, different ideas and try and put together a big picture that, that sets the scene for the next 10, 15 years. And once we've got that in place, then the rest of the plan should start to, to hang around that quite quickly, we hope. There was some misunderstanding about neighbourhood planning generally. A lot of uh, communities around the country felt that it was a, a, a chance to block new housing. It, it isn't. It's a chance to shape development on the terms or on the, on the conditions that the community feel are important. So a neighbourhood plan cannot ask for fewer houses than the borough or district is, uh, is uh, suggesting it should take, but it can uh, distribute them in a different way, it can look at different sites or alternative sites, and it can try and fit the jigsaw together in a way that feels best for that community. So where new homes could go, where new investment in uh, maybe additional classrooms for the school, where a new community hall or a village hall could go, and how this all fits together is really in the power of uh, communities like parish and town councils through neighbourhood plans. So they can't uh, protest and block development, but they can certainly shape it on the, on the, along the lines that the community wants to see it happening. Affordable housing is a, is a real issue, not just uh, in, in Tysos Parish, but across the country, but acutely so in the southeast of England, where house prices are significantly higher. And uh, neighbourhood planning and planning generally should be addressing this, but it is not an easy thing at all. I mean, the price of land influences the price of property and, and planning can address that and influence that 
Um, but there are various mechanisms within the, the planning framework for low-cost housing, starter homes, um, shared equity for rent and to, to buy, and homes for local people that have grown up here, so you can actually prioritise who will, who will eventually live in these houses. All of that is available, and it's, uh, it, the, those mechanisms are available, but they're quite complex, and this plan needs to start to bring those into, into, uh, into play at the right time so that the sites can deliver that. Because it's a real, very real concern that people that have grown up here and want to stay here are simply priced out and can't do it. Um, so who are these houses for? That's the big question. And who's the plan for? And that's not to say outsiders aren't welcome, because many villages and across the country, people who've moved in in the last sort of five, ten years have become sort of life and soul of community groups and activists and, and getting involved in, in running things. So all villages need sort of new blood, as it were, but they've got to also provide for those that want to stay in the village where they grew up. So these are things that the plan will, will be looking at for sure. A common recurring thing uh, when we've worked around the country is so many people say, uh, you know, the place we live is just fine as it is, you know, it's great, uh, we don't want any change at all. And then after about no more than five, ten minutes conversation, they'll be saying how the village shop closed and how the school's not as good as it used to be or the school's better than it used to be or there's more traffic than there's ever been and actually we could do with another football pitch because the junior football team's really successful and suddenly you realise, and they realise, that change has happened in the time they've lived there and nothing stands still. So the best thing to do uh, in, in this situation is actually try and predict and anticipate change and uh, accommodate that change in the best way. So the plan is about 10, 15, 20 years from now and what a village and a parish like Ticehurst, Flimwell, uh, Stonegate uh, need in order to, to, to have the right infrastructure, the right community, the right balance of uses and activities. Um, so change is going to happen. Uh, it's, is it change being done to you or is it change that you can manage and shape through your plan? And that's the, the big question really. There's a lot of uh, uh, concern and anxiety about development and the fact that a village or a parish isn't able to cope or, or take it on. And um, I think they're all very legitimate concerns and those anxieties are very real. However, to say that in 2016 you're full <laughs> after a thousand years of development is a coincidence or unlucky. So to use an infrastructure blockage, as it were, be it drainage or traffic or school places, as a reason not to build houses, won't stand up long term because the investment will be found at some point or can be found. So any resistance to housing will fall away at that point. I'd be much more interested in a series of arguments around why a particular site is not suited to housing and why another site is better suited to housing. And then also coming up with the list of improvements that are necessary to make that housing work it might be an extra consulting room at the GP or uh, an extra classroom on the school or uh, in improvements to parking arrangements. But there are ways around all of this. And um, for example, we worked in a, a part of Kent a few years ago and they were saying, um, we can't have any more houses because there's not enough water, drought conditions. And it was true at the time, there was a lot of drought. 12 months later, it was flood conditions. So they were building arguments around that they couldn't have new housing because of uh, infrastructure but that, that can be solved. It can be very expensive, but it can be solved. So I think it's much more interesting and much more important that a, a village and a parish sets out what's needed for, to make housing work in the right places. And I think that's what's been really encouraging here is that people are engaging with that and coming up with some very good ideas to link uh, an improvement in the infrastructure with uh, uh, maybe an increase in housing numbers and make those fit together. One can't happen without the other. What got me interested in, in planning and urban design and rural design and villages and towns and cities is that when we do it right, buildings in landscape are beautiful and they're fantastic and uh, they're you know, breathtaking. And we have a long tradition in this country of creating really beautiful places. And uh, Stonegate and Ticehurst are fabulous. And they've got a series of wonderful buildings set in wonderful landscape. Um, but the, the challenge or the problem seems to be the last 50 years, 60 years in Britain, we've sort of forgotten how to do it. And if anyone suggests new housing development, everyone just fears the worst. And understandably so, because we built some really poor quality stuff. And uh, often the sites that a local authority would rather have are sites that are hidden, out of, out of the way, 
Um, and implicit in that is the fact that they have no confidence that architecture on show is any good. So they'll allocate housing down a dip or out of the way, but certainly not on top of a hill. And I think that sends out the message that we've lost our confidence in designing beautiful buildings that we can be proud of. So I think if neighbourhood planning can really give people confidence back in that, uh, we should be brave enough to, to, to be developing buildings in the right place, but also making sure that they're of the highest standard. One way to think of it is that whatever this neighbourhood plan uh, uh, develops and encourages should be the conservation areas of the future. They should be good enough to be uh, looked back on fondly as the right thing at the right time. Uh, we don't know, we haven't done that very well, so now's the time to, to be, uh, to turn that around, I think, and make, make a much better effort on the quality of design. And this plan, when it's, it's finally brought together, um, will be subject to a, a local referendum, and it's the, interestingly, it's the only part of the planning system that has that, that democratic check at the end of it. So if a majority of those that vote in the referendum think the plan is a good plan and it should be adopted as, as the plan for the, the parish, uh, rather district council, the, the local authority will take that plan on and it will become the guiding document for all planning decisions in the parish over the next uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, so it really is quite a powerful uh, instrument if it, if, it's, if it finally reaches that stage and, and the referendum is, uh, is a yes vote.